This morning, we're reading Matthew 18, 15 through 35. If your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, <clears throat> like you're listening to me, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you, so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Again, I, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about any matter that you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you everything. Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. At this, his fellow servant fell down and began begging him, Be patient with, with me, and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him into the prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then, after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. So also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. You can be seated. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Parker Stringer. I am the youth director here at this church, and so my main responsibility is, is teaching 6th uh, through 12th grade uh, on Wednesdays over on the other side uh, of, of the street. And uh, before we really get into everything, I got, I got two things I, I want to say. First of all, thank you for being here. And really, I mean, thank you for being here. It looks pretty full. And I think statistically, uh, when David's not, not speaking, uh, it's not as full. So <laughs> thank you, like really, for me. And um, the second thing I want to share with you, I actually share with us with the uh, FCA on, on this Friday, um, before we enter into prayers, that God loves you. God loves you. You. He loves every single one of you. He finds you completely irresistible. And not only does God love you, but he likes you. Because just like maybe our spouse, we, don't, we, we love them, but we don't always like them. In the moment, God loves you and he likes you. And, and the way that he feels about you has nothing, it is nothing like that. And, and something else I, I would like to say is that I, I know that we have a lot of young families here. And, and it's been really hard. Uh, just to get to come, uh, just to get to come up the church, and it, it looked like a war getting in here. Um, and, and you may have been sitting through worship. Uh, it just like, man, I'm not feeling anything. Like, I don't even know if I really wanted to come to church today. Like, whatever that is, and I just, I just want to let you know, like, that is, that's, that's pretty normal. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's okay. But it is an absolutely normal reaction um, in, in our own flesh and our own worldly selves. And so this is the reason, and I know David has explained this, this is the reason that we always take a minute and pause. And it's not just David praying over you, and it's not just going to be me praying over you, but I want to invite you. Just change your rhythms, slow down, and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you today because I'm going to tell you I have nothing to give you but I hope that you hear from him. Let's pray. Oh, oh, Father. 
God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your love that, that you would reach out, even to me as someone that is so undeserving, that you would extend your grace, your mercy, your compassion, and your forgiveness, that you would pursue me time and time and time again. In my doubting, and even in times where I'm actively running away from you. God, I just pray that you calm my anxious heart, that you still my distracted mind, that you give me clarity into your word today. Holy Spirit, I pray that you move and that you speak to me, God, and that you speak through me. That you grant me conviction and repentance this morning. And most of all, let me see my Father's love this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, today's title uh, for this sermon is Forgiveness. It's easy to want, it's hard to give, and uh, I apologize, I put the wrong uh, chapter on there, but we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18. So if you have your Bibles, you're going to turn them on on your phone uh, if you would like to follow along on there. Feel free to do so. Matthew chapter 18, verses uh, 15. Before we get into there... um, what really gave me the, the inspiration to want to share this with you today is, is as David was uh, preaching, it, when he was first starting preaching through Exodus, he kind of shared something with all of us on, on how he even got to the point where he kind of decided or felt led to preach through Exodus. Uh, and, and, and he was, he was going to do a character study on Moses. You can correct me if I'm wrong. And, and just as you were studying and as you were reading the word, it, it was just kind of turning you over. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, it was turning you over into this, this book that, that I'm sure you've read many, many times before and you've studied through and possibly even preached through before. It, 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 it um, at least studied. It, it just had a new meaning. Yeah, and that, I really identified with that because if you don't know, maybe your kids don't talk to you or maybe you don't have students over there, we have also been slowly going through a different book in the Bible uh, across the street on Wednesdays, and that's been the book of Matthew. And, and this would not even be the third time that I've slowly gone through the book of Matthew. In fact, one time me and my wife spent six months just studying that book. But man, just slowly, just soaking in the word, and slowly reading the teachings of Jesus, it, it has it's turned me over, it's shaken me up, and, and I see even Jesus in a whole new light, and, and I've been inspired and challenged that entire way. And uh, so I, I felt led to share uh, this lesson with you, which is a version of what uh, your, your kiddos got uh, about a month or a month and a half ago. And it was in Matthew chapter 18. This would have been our second week in, in, in Matthew 18. It's split into two parts. So Matthew chapter 18 is split into two parts. Um, uh, Jesus' disciples, they'll ask him a question. He has a little bit of teaching and, and retort to that. It ends with a parable. And, and the first part of that, uh, the, the disciples ask, like, okay, well, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And, and, and Jesus takes a step back and he's like, hey, you're asking the wrong question. Like, to even get into the kingdom of heaven, we have to humble ourselves like a, a, a child. And uh, I'm going to quote Tim Mackey here. I think I have that quote here. I do not. So it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to quote Tim Mackey on, on I, I think this is a really good, um, just descriptor of the entire chapter of Matthew 18. And it says, uh, he says, the quality and health of my interpersonal relationships tell the real truth of how I feel about God and to other people. I'll say it again. The quality and health of how I have relation with other people, how I think about them, how I treat them, how I interact with them, tells the real truth of how I feel about God and how I feel about other people. So, Matthew 18, verse 15. So this is the second part. And, and Jesus, uh, he, he teaches uh, his disciples, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. And so if your brother sins against you, if your brother, if, if another believer, like somebody in the church, they offend you, if they hurt you, what does Jesus tell us to do here? He say like, just to pray about it? Do you just pour it all out on your accountability partner? Do you tolerate it? Do you like, okay, I need to grow thicker skin? No, Jesus, do we do all those things? Yes. But he calls us, he tells us to move into that hurt, to move into that relationship, to to restore it, 
to allow forgiveness to happen within it. And so he says, if, you, if he listens to you, you have won your brother. You've won your brother. But if you won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. And so Jesus is quoting the Old Testament here. I don't have time to like pull that out or anything else. But what he's saying is, is okay, that, that person won't relent. That was cool. Uh, <laughs> if that person won't relent, like, I don't think I did anything wrong to you. I don't care anything else. Bring some more people in. Bring more wisdom in because guess what? You may have just gotten your pride hurt a little bit. And, and somebody's like, hey, you know what? Like, it's, it's, you're making a big deal out of nothing. But at the same time, the person said, no, no. This, this other person needs to repent. They need to apologize because they, they've hurt another brother. They've sinned against another brother. Verse 17, if he doesn't pay attention to them, even them, then tell the church. Bring more people into that conversation. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Other translations say, let him be like an unbeliever. And so what Jesus isn't saying here is like just stamp him with like an evil, uh, you know, an E on his forehead. And like this person just is never allowed in the church or anything else again. Like how did Jesus treat Gentiles? How did Jesus approach tax collectors? He invited them into the kingdom. And so when you encounter somebody that's like this, that it may be close to you or whatever else, like we're not just to get mad at them. We're not even called to necessarily completely remove them from our lives, Maybe. But the, the, the tone and the context of that conversation changes. Because they're not a follower of Christ. And so, of course, if they haven't received that forgiveness, then, then of course, they're going to be acting in a way that doesn't act like a disciple of Jesus Christ. We're going to have to remember that one for here in a moment. All of that. And so then Peter approached Jesus. Like, this is his reaction to that teaching. He's like, okay, well, we're talking about forgiveness. And he asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? And, and, and typically, like, the preacher guy is going to come up here and make fun of Peter. I can never do that because I see myself in him too much. But the thing is, is like, I, I think I would even have trouble in my own flesh to follow G uh, Peter's teachings here, right? As many as seven times? If you lie about me, if you lie to me, if you cheat me, like, on, like I think if we're being honest, like, are we really going to forgive somebody seven times? Like, you got like two or three maybe with me. I'm just going to be honest. In my flesh. Like, let's, yeah, right? I, like, let's be honest, right? <laughs> and so, like, even with the Peter's teaching, like, in my flesh, in what I want to do, like, man, that's a lot. Like, go Peter, I say. But Jesus says no. Once again, you're approaching this the wrong way. I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. And if you have your Bible open or anything else, you can read, usually there's a little notation that it's either 70 times seven or it's 77. Which is really interesting because Jesus, this isn't just about Jesus counting or, or we're bringing math into the Bible or something, which is gross. Uh, <laughs> but... Jesus is alluding to something else because I, I, don't, I, I don't know if you remember in, in Genesis 7, there, there's actually an, another place where they, they kind of translated to either 77 or if you read the King James, it's 70 and 7 times. And, and so it's in Genesis 4, verse uh, 24. But to, before we get there, we're, we're going to... Uh, give a little bit of context. And so we all know the story of Cain and Abel, right? Like um, Cain was jealous of Abel. Abel had God's favor. Cain killed Abel. And, and then God had, 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 you know, hey, you're going to have to leave my presence. You're, you're going to have to go. You're going to be a wanderer on the earth. And, and then Cain uh, said, no, like if, if I do that, I'm going to die. Like somebody's going to kill me. And the Lord said to Cain, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. It's already kind of clicking a little bit here because we have Peter with the forgiveness on seven times. But then Cain had some babies, and those babies have babies and babies and babies and babies later. Um, <laughs> uh, there, there was a, another man born by the name of, of Lamech, uh, by the name of Lamech. And uh, he says something really uh, funny <laughs> that I, can't, I laugh every time. And he says, listen to me, O wives of Lamech. Right? Like, can you imagine? Oh, listen to me, O wife of Parker. I'm hungry, and can you make lunch or something? I don't know. Like, that's just... <laughs> It's just a really weird way to talk, but listen to me, O wives of Lamech. Hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me. 
a young man for injuring me. And so whether this, this young man decided to pick a fight or he just wounded his pride, it doesn't matter because Lamech said, you're going to hurt me? Oh, no. I'm going to bear my full wrath on you. I'll have my full vengeance. And so uh, Lamech then tells his wives, if Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times, or how it's read 70 and 7, 70 times 7. I think Jesus is alluding to this because is it God that's avenging Lamech? No. No, Lamech took that on upon himself. He's like, if you're going to hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. It's not even about the math. Like, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to be unbridled in my vengeance. And so Jesus is saying here, in the same way that Lamech was unbridled in his vengeance, Peter, it's, it's not about counting how many times you have to forgive, because that's not forgiveness, that's tolerance. That's you waiting until, and just tolerating it, you're waiting until I don't have to do this anymore, and then I can act and do what I want to do. And so for a follower of Jesus Christ, we're not to have the natural tendency. When we're hurt, we want to hurt other people. We all have that in us, that Lamech that has this unbridled vengeance. Jesus says a follower of his is going to be somebody that is unbridled with forgiveness. But instead of explaining that, as Jesus does, he, he moves into a, a, a parable. And so we're going to read through this pretty uh, quickly. Uh, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven, and so that's what he's saying, for this reason, followers of me, heaven on earth will be like this. It can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. 10,000 talents. Like most of us in here are like, oh, that's, maybe that's a lot. I don't know. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And, and uh, we're not going to get into the math and everything else. I did it off of a quick Google search. Um, 10,000 talents. is One talent is 6,000 denarii. One denarii is, is roughly a day's wages for a single person. If a day's wages is worth $50, uh, which is, I believe, below the poverty line, <laughs> well below it. It's like 18 grand if you work 365 days a year. If that's how much one denarii is, then 10,000 talents is $3 billion, <laughs> right? And so it doesn't matter if like you half that amount, quarter that amount. Either way, a servant in a king's house, not a, a rich, well-going merchant, not another king, not, not somebody that had a lot of money, a servant in the king's house owed the king $3 billion. Jesus is, is using this kind of language because when you hear that, you're like, oh, wow. Like, the money doesn't even matter. <laughs> like, the number doesn't matter. It's just way more than, than an individual, a family, an entire church, uh, possibly even like a county could pay, <laughs> right? Like, it is, it is just, uh, it just an, an, like, an exorbitant amount of money. And, and that's like the hearer, the disciples would have heard that. So the, this man owes him 10,000 talents, 10,000 bags of gold, $3 billion, whatever it is. Since he didn't have the money to pay for it, duh, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, his servant fell down before him and said, be patient with me. I will pay you everything. No, you won't. <laughs> right? Then the master of that servant had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. That servant went out and found another one of his servants who owed him a hundred denarii. If, if the 10,000 talents is three billion, then 100 denarii is 5,000 bucks. Uh, he grabbed him, started choking him, and said, pay what you owe. At this, the fellow servant fell down and began begging him, be patient with me. I will pay you back. First of all, the second one was a payable offense. Like you could have saved up and given it to him genuinely. But note what this guy did. He, he, he had this natural tendency of Lamech. Because how did the king say? He king brought this servant before him, set him down and said, hey, you owe me money. This, this other servant, the wicked servant is what, he, what his name is. He began choking this other man and then told him, you owe me my money back. But the, the wicked servant wasn't willing Instead, he went and threw him into the prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported their, to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgive you all of that debt because you begged me. 
shouldn't you have also had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. Can I have that? Cool, I'm taking it. That really worked out because I needed a good pause there. So that's a a parable of Jesus. You know, if we read that typically, you know, we're reading verse by or chapter by chapter. Maybe you're trying to get multiple chapters in one day. That's something I, I think you would skip. But when you have to slow down and explain this, then this next verse is quite frankly a bit of a gut punch. And so now Jesus is giving commentary. He says, so also my heavenly father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Hmm. If we sit on that and allow that to ruminate, that's, that's a hard teaching because what, what did the king, what did the king do? He, he put this servant that, that wouldn't forgive the other servant. He put him in a place that he didn't want to go, like a prison, to pay off a debt that he could have never paid back, to be tormented or tortured, essentially forever, right? Because it's so much that even in a hundred lifetimes, like he would not have been able to pay this back. What does that place sound like? That would be hell, wouldn't it? (laughs) Right? And so, my heavenly father will do to you unless if every one of you forgives his brother or sister from the heart. Hmm. Well, this isn't the first time that Jesus taught on that. So let's see if we get uh, something else from this. So for if you forgive, so this is in Matthew uh, chapter six, Jesus had had just kind of, uh, he he had uh, given his disciples the Lord prayer. And here's here's his commentary at the end of it. Uh, It says, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others of their sins, their father, uh, your father, will not forgive your sins. Okay, so does Jesus take our ability to forgive seriously, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, really, really, really seriously, because I... I, you know, maybe I missed it, but, you know, I, I know that we always talk about coming to church and reading our Bibles and, and, and being in community and everything else, but I, I don't think that there was this kind of teeth when, when Jesus said anything else. But when he talks about forgiveness, like, this is serious. And in fact, this is kind of like heaven or hell serious. And if you're kind of picking up on this right now, because it, at, at first this person received the king's forgiveness and then it seems like he lost it, Let's, let's kind of explore that a little bit. And so uh, what church is this? It's the Bridge Fellowship. And so I'm guessing, I think I've heard this story, uh, the Bridge Fellowship is named from that little illustration from the bridge and the person. If not, it doesn't matter, maybe. You know, let, let's talk about it because I've seen Jeff give it a million times. Uh, so there's an illustration where like you're over here and, and God's over here and in between you and him there's this just massive chasm, right? And in that chasm, there's a, this little, we'll pretend it's on the slide, it, it's, it's labeled sin, right? And because of this sin, the like you will never be able to get with God and, and to have community and relationship and everything else. And then next slide over, there's a cross with like Jesus' name on it. It's because uh, Jesus paid the price for our sins that we receive forgiveness of those sins that, that we uh, can commune with God again. And so what happens when, when you remove that forgiveness from the illustration? There's the chasm again. And so I think a lot of people, some, may interpret this passage in a vacuum because it almost sounds like I'm saying that you can lose your salvation. But I don't think that's what it's saying. I don't, I, in fact, I, I know that's not what it's saying because um, if you go back to verse 15, if somebody can get that for me on the slide, and if not, I'll, I'll just read it. If you go back to verse 15, we have to remember this parable is an explanation of Jesus' previous teaching, right? And so verse 15 said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him your fault. Between you and him, if he listens to you, you have won your brother. And so uh, if he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention even to the church, treat him like a Gentile 
or a tax collector. This, this is an individual that, that was never a disciple of Jesus Christ to begin with. And so let's look real quick. Guys, if y'all can go back to verse 24. I'm sorry, verse 26. And, and, and let's look at this wicked servant one more time. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, Oh, my king, my master, I, I know I have borrowed more from you than I will ever be able to pay back. And, and I have been foolish, I have been wrong, and I have been wicked, and I do not deserve forgiveness, but I'm coming before you. I'm asking just in, in, that you have a, a measure of compassion and mercy on me. Please forgive me what you've given me. Mm. Oh, wait, that's not what he said, is it? <laughs> right? That's not what he said. Look at the pride of this servant, right? When the servant found out that he had a debt that he would never be able to pay back, like this is an absorbent amount of money, the pride in him said, hey, I know I owe you so much, just give me a little bit of time. I got this. I got this. I can, I can do this on my own. I don't even need your forgiveness. He didn't ask for it. He said, be patient with me. Give me more time. Now tell me this, if that's how we approach God in his infinite mercy and forgiveness, would that chasm not still be there? It doesn't matter. Hey, God, hey, I know I've done some things. I know I've messed up, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to make it right. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray, and I'll tell you what, I'm just going to be really holy. I'm even going to vote Republican. I'm, I'm going to do all the right stuff. Like, I'm going to do all the right things, God. Like, hey, you know, we're, we're good. We're, me and you, we're going to be good. Like, no, that is not how it works, and that's not how forgiveness works in this passage. This is the exact person. Uh, give me back to that, um, that uh, blank slide, please. Actually, just go to the next one, and I'll keep preaching. Uh, this is the exact kind of person that Jesus was talking about, once again in, in chapter 6, when there would be those that would come before him, and they would call on the name of Jesus, and they would say, Lord, Lord, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name? And Jesus would turn around and say, get away from me. I never knew you. You never did the will of my Father. You never accepted the mercy of my Father. I'll quote a commentary and we'll move on. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the person who said this, but because these warnings were addressed to the community of believers, we might conclude that a believer can lose his salvation and be sent to hell. Indeed, the warning is intended to be sober, to intended to sober believers concerning the seriousness of stumbling but the eternal punishment would only be carried out on a person who proved by their sin that he had never been a child of God. So, uh, this is where we're at. Um, and it would be really easy just to kind of lit it there and, and dig down. But, does Jesus take forgiveness seriously? <laughs> yes. Really, really absolutely, deathly, seriously. <laughs> like, this is a big deal for him. And so why is this such a big deal for him? I'm, I'm actually going to quote somebody else here, and it's Lewis Smead's The Art of Forgiving. Actually, I'll quote that later. And so let, let's define what forgiveness is. So forgiveness, the, 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 uh, the Greek word that we have here, it's pronounced aphaemi. Can y'all say that? Aphaemi. Aphaemi. So aphaemi. Aphaemi. We're not getting out of this until you do it. Aphaemi. There we go. Yeah, that's kind of fun. It's fun to say weird words. So it's literal definition outside of just forgiveness means to send away, leave alone, release, or let go. And so a, a base definition of this is like I'm, I'm carrying a massive amount of weight, and, and, and I just release it, and then I experience that, that, that freedom, that, that loss of weight. And so we see this also, the Ephaemi verse in Matthew chapter 4, and they immediately, the, some of his disciples, they immediately Ephaemi, the boat, and their father, uh, and they followed Jesus. They left behind the father. They left behind that boat. It's not necessarily a bad thing to follow after Jesus. And so it's releasing, it's letting go. So forgiveness, what is forgiveness? It's, it's us releasing of that past hurt. It, it's, it's letting go of, of our right uh, for, for vengeance and, and letting go of that desire to hurt other people. But we'll talk about that just a little bit more. Because 
I really think that it's not about forgiveness necessarily that Jesus is absolutely serious about. I think his biggest concern is, is what unforgiveness does to our hearts. So let's, let's note here, because I've, I've kind of pointed out the eternal perspective from this verse, but I, I believe it also kind of illustrates a, a worldly one that, that we can choose to live in. Jesus depicts as someone who won't forgive someone who is trapped and tortured. Unforgiveness is one of the worst ways that we choose to live. Holding on to the grudge, playing the movie in our heads, not letting go of the anger and humiliation will eventually degrade our own humanity to the point where we end up either becoming the person that hurt us or, or we become nothing but that hurt and nothing but that pain. It is physically, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally unhealthy. All we can do, when all we can do is play those same hurts over and over and over and over again in our head, we choose to keep the wounds fresh until they become infected. In the process of forgiveness, I'm, I'm going to be clear on a few things here. There may be plenty of emotions that come into play even after the forgiving is finished. It's okay to feel hurt. It's okay to feel angry at the wrongdoing, at the injustice that has happened against us because somebody has sinned against us, somebody has hurt us. What is not okay, what degrades our humanity is hatred, rage, and anxiety. And so just as important to define what forgiveness is, I, I think it is equally important to define what forgiveness is not because it, just like the word love, like I can love pizza and I can love my wife, those are two different, uh, those are two different meanings, yes? Uh, forgiveness in the same way, if I asked 10 different people, I think I would get 10 different definitions. And so I, I would like to define what forgiveness is not. The, the first thing that I, I believe forgiveness is not is allowing someone to walk all over you. Forgiveness is not allowing to somebody to walk all over you. Let's bring it back verse 15 and just leave this on the slide, please. But verse 15, if somebody sins against you, like their, their forgiveness has to happen there, yeah? Like if you hurt me, like there's something I have to let go of there. Do I just tolerate it? Do I just act like it didn't happen? Do I just like, okay, I need, to, I need to get a thicker skin? No. Once again, like I'm called to move into that and say, hey, listen, what I, what I think what you did was wrong and you hurt me. Right? We're, we're called into action. We're, we're not called just to roll over and take it over and over and over again. And so something I would like to point out here is that the steps to forgiveness is a choice that we make. It's not just something that we automatically live. For some of us, maybe that's a gift that we've had. And that's a gift that's been given to us. But forgiveness, especially when we've been hurt deeply, is a choice that we choose to walk through. Forgiveness is not tolerating or excusing for um, offense. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll leave this one with this. Forgiving and forgiving, sorry, forgiving and forgetting is harmful advice. It is harmful, wrong advice. We are not called to forget. In fact, if you did forget, then there probably wasn't much to forgive in the first place. Uh, we only got three here. Uh, can, I, can I come back to returning back to the way things were before? Uh, forgiveness is not returning back to the way things were before. And so uh, essentially, we're not necessarily called right back into reconciliation, even if that is the preferable option. And so how are we called to forgive in verse 35? Don't go to it. Uh, how are we called to forgive at the end of that parable? We're called to forgive in, in, in our hearts. Jesus calls us to forgive in our hearts. What is the exact thing that I have no control over in someone else? Their heart. Right. And, and so forgiveness is not something that has to happen between two people or a group of people. For me to forgive, it's something that I do. It's a choice that I make that God will lead me to. Um, I think I have a quote here. I do. Uh, this is Lewis Smedes. He wrote the book, The Art of Forgiving. If you haven't heard of it, it's not super popular. It's, it's really good. It's very practical, very simple, has a lot of stories in it. It's, uh, I really liked it, uh, most of it. Uh, he says, a wounded person should not put her future happiness in the hands of the person who made her miserable. And so in some cases, yes, reconciliation should happen. If, if Chuck says something offensive to me, I'm called to go and, 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 and say, hey, Chuck, that, that really hurt hurt me, and, and, and reconciliation, restoration of that re relationship can be a good thing. Now, I have another man here. His name is Buck. 
Uh, we'll just, yeah, he has a wonderful wife. His name, her, his name is Molly, a uh, wonderful woman. <laughs> but uh, the, if another man, let's say that uh, like we were best friends and, and he cheated me in some way, stole a lot of money. I lost, I lost a business. I lost a home. Can I choose to forgive that? Yes. Does that mean that we're going to be best friends after that? No, probably not. And that's okay. And that's absolutely okay. Within that, Mm. Within that, I want to be absolutely clear here because I I haven't been doing this that long, but I've been in ministry long enough to know that uh, even in a room this size, that there are are people here that have gone through abuse and and that you you may be currently being uh, abused, neglected, or, or hurt in some way. If you are in an abusive situation, the first step is to find safety so that you can find forgiveness. Last one on this. Uh, The last thing that forgiveness is not is keeping someone from facing the consequences of their actions. And so uh, this man here that that stole from me, he cheated me, I lost out of a business, everything else. Let's say he did that illegally. Uh, So am I able to forgive him, but at the same time, can justice also uh, be brought upon that man? Can can he be legally held liable for everything that he did? Absolutely, yes. I can forgive him, but still, worldly justice can still happen. It is absolutely a thing. So forgiveness is not just, hey, you, you, you got, you got to, yeah, I'm going to forgive you, you're off the hook. It could be. It absolutely could be that. And in some cases, we're called to die to ourselves and allow that to happen. But it's not it for every case. That's why we see in that parable, we, when, when, when we are hurt, we bring more people into it. Because it calls for a kingdom-focused wisdom from our uh, fellow believers. So uh, to bring it down... There we go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we define what forgiveness is not. Uh, we're going to be wrapping it up with these next uh, two things. So some obstacles that we have to uh, get past on our way to forgiveness. Uh, the first, uh, so these are, so when I've decided to forgive somebody that has actually hurt me, that has wounded me deeply, um, what we're called to move into is that we have to be able to restore their humanity back into them. You see, the thing is, is that when somebody hurts us, like this person here, and, and I play that movie over and over and over again, this person uh, is no longer just a human being that made some bad decisions because they were raised a certain way or they have hurts or anything else, I turn them in. They're, they're, in my head, they are now a liar. They're a cheat. They're an abuser. Like whatever it is, I turn them into this. this the, I turn them into the, the hurt that they gave me. And then that's, it, 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 it degrades, I, I degrade their humanity over and over and over again. And I have to get to the point where I see them as a person that is made in the image of God that deserves forgiveness every bit as much as I did because just as they did and just like in the parable, I have a debt that I will never be able to pay back, but God chose to forgive me. Another obstacle in the way of forgiveness is giving up the desire to make them suffer. The, the, the phrase is hurt people, hurt people, right? And, and so when I live in that hurt, when I just run over it over and over and over again, like Lamech, there's, there's this thing that I want to do. I, I just, I want them to know how bad I felt. I don't want just justice. I want vengeance. I want them to hurt as much as I did, but I want it more over. And so we have to be able to give up, not justice, but we have to give up that desire to make them suffer. We have to give up the desire to take vengeance in our own hands. And finally, another, uh, the last obstacle in the way of forgiveness is that we have to learn to bless instead of curse. And the only thing I mean by that, and I'm going to say this a second time, and I'm doing it on purpose, because this is what the parable is about is understanding the love of the Father. Understanding that I don't deserve forgiveness, but it was given to me. And regardless of how I was hurt, that other individual is loved by God. And I have to get past the point that I want that person to hurt. I, want the, I, don't think, I think they're unredeemable, and I want them to go to hell because they don't deserve God's forgiveness like I did. We have to get past that point to where we see them as an image, uh, as a human being made in the image of God. So what do we do 
when we are unable to forgive. I recognize that there are those here that have experienced pain that I could not even be able to imagine. In some of our stories, God may gift us uh, with, with just the ability to forgive. And we see that in other people, like they, they've been hurt and, and they, they have this wonderful story of how God just worked on them and they're able to forgive them and it just seems so easy. They're able to lay all that stuff down at Jesus' feet. But I'm certain that there are others in this room right now that are unable to get to that place. Like you've tried, you want to get there, but you can't do it, you won't do it, you don't know how. And I want to go back to the end of this verse because what Jesus said is it's not those, uh, it's for those that do not forgive, those that refuse to forgive, the, the, those that say, I understand God's forgiveness, but I'm not going there because that person doesn't get it. It doesn't say those that struggle to forgive, those that are having a really hard time, those that are like, I, I don't know if I can get to that place right now. That's not what he's saying. And so what do we do when we get to that point? We pray. We come before the Father and we pray, but we pray Honestly, I have a quote here from C.S. Lewis. It says, we must lay down before him what is in us, not what ought to be in us. And, and so God isn't expecting a, a perfected version of ourselves where we get past all of these hurts and then we come before him and, hey, God, look how holy I am. I got past all that stuff on my own. God isn't looking for us. This is, it can be a good thing. He can teach us to pray. But he's not looking for us just to read some cold prayer. If that's how it is in our hearts, then boom, now we're good. The same person that prayed, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He refreshes my soul. It's King David. The same person that prayed, every day I will praise you and extol your name forever is the same man that prayed, may burning coals fall on them. May they be thrown into the fire in the miry pits, never to rise. He prayed, I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for God. And so when we pray honestly, when we have this, this strong amount of hurt, it's okay to get mad. It's okay to get upset. Jesus got emotional. David questioned God here. Scream why into the darkness. Lay it all out before God. God, what were you doing? What were you thinking? Why did this happen to me? Don't you know how much this messed me up? I will never be the same because of what you allowed. How are you good? How are you good in this? How does your good come from this? We have to be able to get to that place. We will never get past the pain and the hurt. Forgiveness is something that Jesus takes seriously. In fact, if it wasn't for him, I, I don't think I would be able to come up here and share any of this with you because I recognize I'm a 33-year-old young man. Most of the people here have more experience than me. Uh, that Maybe you know the Bible better than me, whatever it is. I feel unworthy to come up here and even just mention any of this. If not for Jesus being able to follow his own teachings even into death. We all know the story. Jesus was tried as an innocent man and found guilty. He was beaten. He was whipped. They, they placed a crown of thorns and pressed it into his head. Like the, 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 the thorns like just pierced his skin. His flesh was flayed just almost to the point of death. They forced him to carry the cross, and they had beat him so badly he couldn't even carry his own torture device. And as they nail his hands and his feet to the cross, he's, he's sweating, blood is dripping down his face, dripping down his arms, dripping down just his whole body. He's in excruciating pain. He can hardly breathe. Everything is becoming dislocated. Like his body is going through agony. God's full weight, all of our sin is being bared down. His full wrath is being bared down on Jesus in this moment. And Jesus is hanging there on the cross. He can't breathe. He, he comes up and, and looks out at everyone else that's there. The Roman soldiers that are callously just, just gambling for his clothing. The, the, the crowds that are mocking him and making fun of him. The religious leaders that are putting judgment upon him. Even the, 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 the thieves on, on either side of him are making fun of him. And, and Jesus pulls up and says, Father, forgive them. because they don't know what they're doing. Jesus is able to take all of that pain, all of the pain that we have ever suffered, all of our mistakes, and in that moment, he still looks on the ones that are actively killing him as his life is being drained from his body. And he, says, he looks at them in love. He says, Father, 
This isn't their fault. Stay your hand. Still your vengeance. Father, please forgive them. And I'm not saying that all those people went to heaven, but he's saying, Father, give them a chance. We have a Lord and Savior that modeled the kind of forgiveness that we're called to emulate. And if I'm being honest with myself, like guys, I get so offended at a petty insult. When something doesn't go my way, I often respond in anger and in pride. And I see, I see all of us doing it. <laughs> For us to be able to forgive, we have to rest in the love, the mercy, the compassion, and the forgiveness of the Father. And, and when we remind ourselves of that, through coming to church, through singing worship, through reading the Bible, through communion, when we remind ourselves of who we are and the price that was paid for us, then all of a sudden that ego starts to come down. That anger begins to still. And I have a full view of God, and I am able to forgive even the greatest of slights. And I'm able to find true healing, not in my own way, but through the forgiveness of Christ. We're going to move into a time of prayer, and I just I want to ask you, where are you holding unforgiveness in your heart today? Are there any hurts that you're currently holding on to? Are you currently suffering because you, you will not forgive? Guys, and I pray as we pray and as we enter into this time of communion, give it to God. Whatever it is that's in your heart, give it to him. God, I thank you for your word. Jesus, I thank you for your teachings that, that aren't just all about uh, just, just us loving and, and doing it. God, I, I, Jesus, I just thank you for your hard teachings. I, I thank you for being willing to go there to see past all of my brokenness and through the muck and everything else and just getting right at the heart of the issue. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the wisdom and the conviction that you bring upon us, the revealing of God's truth. So God, in this moment, I just pray that you allow us to reflect and analyze just to see, God, if, there, if we've held unforgiveness in our hearts, if we're allowing that movie to play over and over and over again, if, we, if we're uh, making those wounds fresh over and over and just living in the pain of offense, of abuse, of a slight, whatever it may be. And forgive us, O oh God. Fill us with your mercy. Give us a full view of your compassion. And grant us your forgiveness. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, if you will stand. I'm going to hand it over to David. Hey, if you'd like to come, you can come down and get your uh, communion cups, and we're going to move into a time of uh, communion. Thank you.
Yeah, so I'm going to invite you. You might want to get your phone and take a picture of the screen. If you don't know that verse, you're not familiar with that verse. Um, there is power in the Word of God. And if you're having problems with bitterness towards someone, so that's a very good indication that you have not forgiven them. I would encourage you to take this verse and memorize this verse. And whenever those thoughts of unforgiveness start to come up in your mind, is just go through this verse. That's a powerful verse. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God. Man, I don't want to do that. And that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. So it's not just you that your unforgiveness impacts. It's everybody connected to you. The Bible says it defiles them. That's how powerful that is. So in that verse, what we're doing is we're asking the Holy Spirit just to rip out that root of bitterness that's in me. Just pull it out. Take it out of my life. And that's the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God working together in our lives. I'll read a few verses here before we continue on. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's go ahead and open up. Now, if you're taking communion, the assumption is that you are a Christian. If you are not a Christian, you should not be taking communion. So you got to make sure that you're in Christ Jesus, that you are a Christian, you're communing with a father. And the next thing is, is that there has to be, there can be unforgiveness between me and somebody else if I'm taking communion. So if you have got, man, if you're listening to the message this morning, the Holy Spirit was speaking to you and said, there's unforgiveness in my heart, then don't be taking communion. Don't take it right now. It's an important thing. So if everything's good between you, and everybody around you and everything is good between you and God, then you're ready to take communion because this, we are coming to the Lord's table. So right now, as you hold that, what's happening is that you're sitting down actually at the table with Jesus. This is as close on earth as you will get to the manifest presence of Jesus right now. He is omnipresent. In the Old Testament, even though he was omnipresent, he had manifest present right there in the tabernacle, in the temple, the cloud. And so this is as close. So like this doesn't become the body and the blood of Jesus, but there's something supernatural that happens here. So right now you are coming. We are coming together into the presence of Jesus, setting down at his table. And we're telling him, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you for, for granting me forgiveness of myself. Thank you for granting me the ability to forgive other people because in and of myself, I can't do this. It is the supernatural act of God. So if you've ever forgiven anyone, God did that. He granted you that ability. You joined him in that. So let's look at this today. Let's look at this. Let's be thankful together. Those of us that are in Christ. Hmm. You feel comfortable, you join me in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for laying down your life. Thank you for taking my place, paying my penalty. You are my God, you are my savior. You are my king. Let's take an Eden Faith Church. Read a few more verses here. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's open up. As we're going through Exodus, I'm getting a whole new value of the new covenant as we'll see 
Um, next week, we go back into getting ready for the plagues. Man, the new covenant we have in Jesus is a covenant of grace. <laughs> Mercy. Grace is, it means that God's given you a gift that you don't deserve. That's what this represents. The blood of Jesus, the atoning sacrifice covers every single bit of our sin. Not because we deserve it, but because God made a promise. That's what the covenant's about. God making a promise and proving to us that he keeps his promises. He's promised you that are in Christ Jesus, that you are forgiven, that you are redeemed. So if there's a desire within your heart today to seek God, to turn away from your sin, that is the supernatural act of God. If you listened to the sermon today and you were convicted, that means God's working in your life. There is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So if you heard the message, God spoke to your heart, and you're like, oh, you felt the pain of that. That's a good thing. The worst place we could be in is to be to hear the message like we heard just then and be like callous and be like, huh, it didn't matter to me. I'm glad they heard it. But if you heard it, that's the work of God in your life. A lot to be thankful for, dear friend. So let's look at this. Let's consider the atoning sacrifice, the new covenant, the grace and the mercy of God as we look at this representative of the blood of Christ. So if you want to pray, pray with me, dear Jesus. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for the new covenant. Thank you for the atonement. You are my king. You are my God. And you are my savior. Let's drink in faith. So if you got any criticism for Parker, he loves criticism and he hates for people to tell him he did a good job. So just to let you know, that's what he likes. Come by and criticize him. Don't tell him he did good. He doesn't like that. Let's go ahead and stand up. I am so thankful for Parker. Love him dearly. And I am, I am thankful that, that he has a servant's heart. He came and he asked if he could give the message the next Sunday that I was going to be stepping back for a Sunday. And so just so grateful for him. I mean, he really is. I mean, like there's, there's so many young men that don't like to take advice. There's so many men, period, that don't like to take advice, period. See y'all laughing at each other out there, okay? I know, I see you. But you know, one thing I appreciate about Parker is Parker is just from the very beginning, he's just, he's always looking for advice. He may not take it, but he's always looking for it. He'll discern it there to see if it's for him or not but anyway thank you so much brother so so appreciate you got one more verse to look at as we close out in prayer I forgot this last week y'all should have criticized me so God we thank you we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy we thank you for your goodness oh God thank you for Parker we pray for him and Nikki God we pray that you will just make their kingdom purpose and their generation crystal clear to them and their daughters and god just fill them with a desire to join you in that we pray we pray for rest for parker today god we pray that he'll just take a holy nap and he will be refreshed and renewed today god we're so thankful that he poured out his heart to us today and god we pray that he'll walk out of here today encouraged encouraged in the holy spirit that he was obedient to you and what you laid on his heart so as you leave out here today, I just want to pray this over every single one of you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace as you go in Jesus' name.